Infective endocarditis is a life-threatening infection of the heart, specifically the endocardium, which is the innermost layer of the heart. Most commonly, this is from a bacterial infection involving the heart valves. For infectious endocarditis to develop, there needs to be the presence of a bacterial infection in the blood, termed bacteremia. There are rare exceptions, such as a contaminated prosthetic valve being installed. Bacteremia can come from the transition of bacteria from another infection site into the blood, introduction via intravenous drug use, and from procedures like dental procedures. However, the endocardium is normally resistant to colonization by microorganisms. Therefore, for infectious endocarditis to develop, there also needs to be an injury to the endocardium. This could come from turbulent blood flow, direct injury from solid particles injected during intravenous drug use, mechanical injury from devices, and chronic inflammation, such as in autoimmune conditions. This injury causes formation of fibrin platelet deposits, termed non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, to which bacteria are able to adhere and to proliferate, forming a vegetation that is then covered by a biofilm protecting it. Particles from the vegetation can also detach and travel along the bloodstream, forming septic emboli, and therefore can affect other organs. That brings us onto the complications. Cardiac complications include valvular insufficiency, most commonly the aortic and mitral valves, and less commonly the tricuspid valve. Ultimately, this can lead to the development of heart failure. Cardiac abscesses can also form, most commonly in the aortic root, and emboli may travel down the coronary arteries and generate a myocardial infarction. The central nervous system is commonly affected, including ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes and the formation of cerebral abscesses. Mycotic aneurysms, which are aneurysms caused by infection of the vessel wall, can form throughout the body's vasculature, but they are particularly common in the cerebral vessels. Emboli can travel to the kidneys and cause renal infarctions, and immune complexes formed to the emboli can deposit in the kidneys, causing glomerulonephritis. The spleen is also a common site of embolization, leading to infarction and abscess formation. If the emboli go into the pulmonary circulation, such as when the tricuspid valve is affected, this can lead to septic pulmonary embolism. Fever is present in 97% of people, often being persistent with no obvious other cause, and may be associated with rigors or night sweats. Fatigue is common, and patients may also complain of dyspnea or shortness of breath on exertion, and chest pain in some cases. Hematuria is also possible if there is renal involvement. On physical exam, there may be a new or changing heart murmur, and there may be blackening of the extremities if emboli have reduced the blood flow. Janeway lesions are painless cutaneous lesions on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, and are the result of microemboli, and splinter hemorrhages can be seen in the nail beds due to capillary injury. Often confused with Janeway lesions are Osler nodes, which are painful erythematous nodules, typically on the tips of the fingers and toes, thought to be due to a local immunological response. Roth spots are visible on fundoscopic examination of the eye as small white-centered retinal hemorrhages coming from retinal capillary rupture. We've said that bacteremia and a predisposing endocardial insult are typically needed for infective endocarditis. Specifically, structural heart disease is the largest risk factor, which used to be commonly from rheumatic heart disease. However, in the developing world, it remains the most common predisposing factor. Prosthetic valves and cardiac devices like defibrillators and pacemakers are significant risk factors present in around one in four cases of infective endocarditis. Underlying congenital causes of structural heart disease 
were present in around 12%. Other factors include intravenous drug use, an immunocompromised state, which can allow bacteria to reach higher concentrations in the blood. Another major factor is exposure to healthcare settings, which is thought to account for one in three cases in the developed world. As we said, the infection is usually bacterial, and the most common causative microorganism varies by country, generally between Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococci. But from recent study averages, Staphylococcus aureus is present in around 26.6%, Streptococcus viridian species in 18.7%, followed by other Streptococcus species at 17.5%, and Enterococcus in 10.5%. These make up over 80 to 90% of causative agents, with the remainder being gram negative bacteria, including the HACEC group, or fungi like Candida albicans. Infective endocarditis is most commonly seen in patients over the age of 50, which is a relatively recent change because in the early 1900s it was most common in patients under the age of 30. This is because back then, Rheumatic heart disease was the main risk factor, which is more common in younger patients, while now degenerative disease, which is seen in older patients, is more prominent. Also, the general population is older and therefore more prone to exposure to healthcare. Around 2 out of 3 patients are male, and although the incidence is less than 10 in 100,000, there is an associated 30-day mortality of 30%. The diagnosis is based on a set of criteria known as the Duke criteria, which were revised in the year 2000 and are now known as the modified Duke criteria. They are divided into pathological criteria and clinical criteria, where pathological criteria include histology or culture of vegetation or cardiac abscess suggesting active endocarditis. If either of these are present, then a definite diagnosis is made. Clinical criteria are divided into major and minor criteria. Major being supporting lab evidence of a typical organism present in two separate blood cultures and evidence of endocardial involvement on echocardiogram. Minor criteria include a predisposing factor such as a heart condition or IV drug use, a fever above 38 degrees, the presence of immunological phenomena like glomerulonephritis or oslo nodes, vascular phenomena such as arterial emboli, mycotic aneurysms, or Janeway lesions. A blood culture that is positive but does not feature a typical agent is also a minor criteria. A definite diagnosis is made if there are two major criteria, one major and three minor, or five minor. The mainstay of treatment is intravenous antibiotics, usually an extended course of two to six weeks because the bacteria are protected and in a location that is not easy to reach. Agents like vancomycin and keftriaxone are favoured as empirical agents to be used after the initial blood cultures are taken. This is important as taking blood cultures after starting antibiotics can lead to negative cultures. Once cultures are grown, specific antibiotic sensitivities can be used for specific antibiotic therapy. Antibiotics may be given prophylactically when a predisposed patient is due to undergo certain procedures, such as dental procedures, but the evidence behind this is not always definitive. Valve replacement may be needed in some cases, such as significant regurgitation, hemodynamic compromise, or complications.